Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the podcast. Today I did a super cool podcast from the top of the Leadenhall building on Leadenhall Street, uh, which is uh, one of the prime pieces of real estate in London, big office block, and it's owned by a Chinese investor called CC Land, who are headquartered in Hong Kong, listed on the stock exchange there. And um, I had a great chat with Adam Golden, who heads up the UK office. And um, so, yeah, CC Land uh, invest in and develop like premium properties in major cities like London. Uh, Adam uh, has probably got one of the top property jobs in London. Um, previously worked for a couple of other big firms, high profile firms, and did some really interesting developments. He did the uh, East Village, the former athletics village in uh, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. The, he did the Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre redevelopment, uh, which is one of the London's largest regeneration projects, and Thomas More Square, a 560,000 square foot office campus in Wapping. So he's done some really cool stuff, and we had a really great chat. We talked about Chinese investment into the UK, uh, where London property is going next, co-working, co-living, and the rental sector in London. So I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Awesome, and we're live. So I'm with Adam Golding, and we're at the top of a Leadenhall building on a rather grey day. It's wet, raining. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to arrange things for you, Lewis, but today um, I've failed, I'm afraid. But, Sorry. Um, the views are still pretty good. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's been like a like a forty second floor event space, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, in the Leadenhall building, we've got some amazing tenants, but we've also got um, a large seven thousand square foot space up here, which I thought was a good setting for us to have a chat. Nice. Um, On top of the world. Kind of. Uh, but we can see the Shard and the Walkie Talkie and Elephant and Castle and um, and and pretty much a 360 of, of London. So awesome. seeing as we're talking about property, I thought this was the right spot. No, perfect. So what do you guys do? So um, CC Land are a Hong Kong listed uh, company and um, they've got a series of investments uh, across the world, uh, but the majority of them are in, Lo- are in London. Um, and last year um, sort of marked a very significant year in terms of acquisitions, um, buying the, the cheese grater uh, was um, which is the Leadenhall building, was probably the one that made the headlines because it was just over a billion pounds. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, and so um, so we buy... So you bought it rather than developed it? No, we bought it. It was developed by British Land and Oxford Properties, right, um, yeah. who are obviously two very big developers in London. Um, but actually, we are now moving into looking at development opportunities as well. So we've got six assets in London now. Um, nice. which all are, what, central London, prime? All, all zone one. So kind of Paddington in the west is the furthest west we have. And then um, this building and, um, and um, another site across the road uh, in, in the east. And then uh, we have a big site in Nine Elms for residential development. Oh, okay. Um, and then we uh, we don't go very far north. Uh, we've got right. um, we've got uh, north being what zone two. No, yeah. north being north of Oxford Street, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, so look, you know, the, um, from a from a Hong Kongese perspective, from a Chinese perspective, um, you know, London is the focal point. So um, I think quality uh, is very much the focus of of CC Land, and um, and and obviously as a relatively newcomers to the UK. The city and submarkets like Paddington are very significant. And um, why is London so attractive? Well, I think I think London um, is attractive for for a number of reasons, um, which I'm sure lots of the listeners already know. Um, but obviously, huge population size, big centre for business, uh, amazing infrastructure, pioneers in terms of um, in terms of innovation. Um, and um, thinking about the next thing um, in terms, be it from the tech sector or the yeah. well-being sector or um, or financial sector. So I think um, I think that definitely plays a part. I think Brexit has actually helped 
um, some of the Asian investment into the UK. Okay. Um, In so, what way? Well, I think the the pound, um, the compression of the pound. So, yeah. uh, which means that obviously they get more for their Hong Kong dollars. Um, yeah. um, and um, and actually in Hong Kong, in, in Asia, you look at the market there, it's actually incredible. We were out there in, in February and the, the cap rates, the capitalization rates, which is the method upon which you value property are very, very low. So, um, so they can range from one to 2% yields. Right. Um, and so actually looking at London and being able to buy the very best, be it the walkie talkie or the cheese grater or you know, Big Tower and Canary Wharf, at three or four percent looks like excellent value yeah, against yeah. something in Hong Kong, right? So, um, so I think there's I think there's a number of factors. I also think there's just a, a general and long-standing affinity between not only the Hong Kongese, which is obvious because of the British connection, yeah. but also you know China generally, um, and obviously the historic trading links between between the two countries. So I think there's very much a focus. I think going back to your question around. Um, around why London. I think education also plays a massive part. Yeah. So you look at the universities here, uh, and especially in London, super high quality universities. And so you know, a lot of the affluent, um, and you know, frankly not even affluent, you know, middle class, upper middle class people in, in Hong Kong have a desire for their children to be educated into uh, a British education yeah. system. Yeah. So you know, you'll get a lot of um, students from China coming to university here, parents might buy an apartment here yeah, and so yeah. there's a constant sort of stream of um, of, of, um, of contact and communication between the UK and, and a China. lot of the new build residential stuff's marketed in Asia first for that reason or? no so actually um, it's not anymore um, so you're right sort of five or six up to five or six years ago um, a lot of the schemes were very much marketed in Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia and um, uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore. But actually now there's a, um, as the rule, I don't know whether it's legislation, but I think it's a understanding that all of um, the property in London has to be marketed in the UK first. Oh, interesting. So- Is that uh, a recent um, change? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, probably five years old. Oh, okay. oh, so, okay. so actually all of the schemes marketed in the UK first, and yeah. then there's the freedom to go and market abroad right. as well. Right. So. How much are the Chinese actually investing in the UK at the moment? Well, I think, I think you're seeing the tip of the iceberg. In tr uh, the answer's really? a lot, yeah, yeah. but I think you're really seeing the tip of the iceberg. I think that um, what we've sort of seen is the, the Chinese pioneers, so to speak, and, uh, and maybe yeah. I'm talking more about mainland China than Hong Kong. Here. Right, right. Uh, and obviously there's other issues with capital restrictions in China in terms of investing abroad. And we can maybe touch on that a little bit later. But, but actually, um, you know, the wealth that you've seen uh, coming across um, from, you know, historically a very much, um, you know, the workhouse, the manufacturing house of yeah. the world yeah. is now coming to the fore and that capital um, is, is looking for a home that's generational um, and, uh, and, and preservation also. So effectively um, looking to find a safe place um, for, um, for, 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 um, for, for their investments. And so you've seen, you know, interestingly, the walkie talkie was bought by a Hong Kong company who make oyster sauce. Oh, really? Right, so yes, yeah, so you're looking at this, that, that's what they're known for. Um, so they're, fight, they're, seeing, they're seeing London as a, a safe haven for their cash as opposed to any other country or well, China or? I, I don't think it's just London. I think sort of major gateway cities in Europe. Um, okay. But London's an obvious attraction um, for all the reasons that we set out before. And actually there are difficulties in European markets in terms of barriers to entry. Um, okay, so we're still like open for business, attracting investment. Yeah, also we have, uh, I think, employment laws um i think um i think le uh, the leasing system here the ability to buy freeholds um are all very attractive um propositions for for asian investors Great. um and actually you know you're not just talking about asian investors i think you know we've seen the middle east we've seen german investors in you know, london seen the whole of the world coming in coming in and buying it and actually i think the Brits are much more open to foreign investment uh, than, say, New York is. Um, okay. If you look at the statistics between New York and London in terms of how many assets are held 
uh, overseas, actually London has a much more open mind to, to selling its assets yeah. to Asian investors or, or overseas investors. And, and uh, in the face of Brexit, I think this might get more and more important and more interesting. Yeah, I, you know, Brexit's a whole other podcast, yeah. isn't it? So, <laughs> yeah. um, um, look, I think, you know, our view on Brexit, or, you know, speaking for myself rather than necessarily for, for CC Land, is that it's in no one's interest for a bad deal. Uh, and I think if you look at the European leaders across the world, um, and how they're influenced potentially, you know, from a whole series of polit geopolitical factors, but also from business factors as well. If you think about the major businessmen in Europe, will have businesses in the UK, right? Which Absolutely. they're, which, and they own, you know, for the reasons that we just discussed, the, yeah. you know, Britain being open, they own businesses that are reliant on the UK being successful. So Absolutely. I think there'll be pressure amongst the European leaders as well as amongst obviously the British leaders to make sure that the deal is good and, or, or fair uh, and make sure that no deal's off the table um, and that, um, that it's an, for want of a better word, an equitable split, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So I think that's a very high level way of, of looking at it and maybe, maybe a bit of a leap of faith because yeah. politicians have let us down yeah. before. But, um, okay. but I'm sort of hopeful that um, the, the, the significance of this will will be limited yeah um, do you feel there's still um a feeling in the public that's quite cautious around foreign investment or too much too many foreign companies owning assets in london and the uk um i think probably from where that really stems is from the housing market so i think you know given the sort of much maligned um construction figures that we have in the uk and this sort of desire to build more I think when you see um, the amount of foreign investment coming into new homes, I think that's what sticks in people's guts rather than rather than um, commercial property per se. So I think you know when you see swathes of new developments being sold overseas, that almost makes the headlines because it's tangible for an yeah, individual absolutely. thinking about a home rather than necessarily thinking about an office block. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that sits within the business world. Okay, fine. How have you seen the city and the West End change the last few years? Um, well, um, I think where we're sitting now, EC3, right, sort of, you, you've worked here yeah. most of your career. Um, and of course, it's always been known as the insurance district. Um, and of course, going back, you know, not so long ago, possibly, you know, 30 years, it would have been pinstripe, you know, chalk pinstripe suits. Yeah, yeah probably, probably the bowler hats were just about phased out by then. A little pain. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think they were gone. You can bring them back. Um, and, um, and very male dominated, right? Probably an older generation. And I think, you know, as we've seen these amazing buildings constructed in EC3 and, you know, credit to the City of London Corporation for consenting them and making them happen, um, this area has needed to expand beyond the insurance district. I don't think it's all the way there now. I yeah. think the city's got, EC3 in particular, has got a long way to go. Um, in terms of what? In terms of breaking the perception as being the insurance district. And yeah. I think, you know, London, if you look at it, King's Cross is a great example. Yeah. Uh, you know, an area that when I was growing up was basically known as the red light district. Yeah. Um, uh, not that it was frequented, but... Um, <laughs> um, but the way Arjun have transformed that area and this sort of idea of it being the tech hub for Facebook and Google. Yeah. And the rents there actually surpassing the city core rent. Really? So you've got, yeah, so you've got rents in King's Cross, which are approaching hundred pounds a square foot. And there's probably a 30% discount, maybe even more Crazy. for these buildings that you see around you. So, um, so, so the city's cheaper than the West End and King's Cross rent wise? A hundred, yeah, absolutely. So the city is, it, and in some respects, it's even cheaper than the city fringe. So areas like Shoreditch and Clerkenwell and Farringdon, where you've got these really interesting warehouse buildings yeah, yeah. and you've got this whole sort of... Cool vibe. Cool vibe. And also, you know, I think, I think it, it brings on a bigger point, which is, which is why. You know, why are these areas more interesting and getting better rents from a commercial perspective? And I think it's about community and about the way London's evolved and the fact that we've got younger 
more of a mix of guys and girls working and yeah. and actually what they want what they what their issues are is that they they can't own their properties so they're you know invariably living in a maybe bed share between sort of leaving university and their mid 30s all striving to buy somewhere yeah um, and so they don't socialize around their homes anymore. Actually, they socialize around their offices. Very true, very um, true. And what you see is yeah. areas like King's Cross and Shoreditch being so popular because the buildings and the areas can deliver that social life for them. Absolutely. And, um, and, and occupiers are being much, are much more concerned about um, get, uh, getting quality. So quality employees and staff retention yeah. um, and capturing talent. And so they're much more cognizant now about um, what their space that they buy into is going to deliver for their employees. Whereas before it was more like, you know, where does it sit relative to the CEO, where the CEO lives? Is there yeah. a car parking space for his roles? <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, so, so I think from our perspective as a landlord, we're looking at a way, you know, where we're sitting in EC3, big towers, you know, kind of the streetscape doesn't really lend itself for culture and community although there are There's a lot of yeah. there we're trying and we're you yeah. know sitting on roman historic oh no, it's Britain like here. history here is crazy exactly so but i think from a cultural perspective you know it's these sort of big big tower blocks it's very difficult to create that community without a central hub yeah. so what we're looking at doing is innovating and saying well how do we break down that how can we provide event spaces within our buildings how can we challenge the we works and the office groups and these great amazing um, concepts uh, of of working creating communities but how do we do that as a traditional landlord who's leasing their space on a floor by floor basis yeah you know we're not going to do beer on tap at the reception <laughs> but can we do um can we do well-being talks? Can we do TED talks? Can we give yeah. up space for, um, for, for helping th the occupiers within the building? Um, and how do we do that? Um, do we do it through tech? You know, do we create an app yeah. where you, know, you, you give people discounts for retailers? You ask them about their well-being. Do you find ways to get into the occupiers and then deliver what they want and use that metrics as a landlord to then start talking to your tenants and say, well, hey, you know your guys, um, you know, they've, 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 they're talking about well-being and they're, they're really taking up the yoga classes and the Pilates classes on the top floor or, you know, and, and providing more meaningful feedback to, um, to, to our tenants. And, you know, that can potentially drive their desirability to stay in our building, to expand our building. So it's a two-way thing, right? Us providing things for them and them doing things for us. It's so. really interesting because then <laughs> compare that to a lot of big firms, and I think there's one big firm here that do that. They don't have enough desks for their employees. Yeah. So you're finding that, and that's probably just cost-driven, right? Yeah, Could or project-driven. You know, they might have yeah. projects <laughs> elsewhere where they, 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 they're happy to hot desk. Yeah, so it's an interesting, like, <laughs> interesting contrast between wanting to build a community, offer stuff for your employees and so forth, and then the other side, um, not having enough desks, people working from home more, and, and just trying to you know, not have as much interaction with their colleagues. Well, look, you're never going to force people to do things that they don't want to do. Some people, you know, it, it might suit their lifestyle to, to, um, to work from home or to hot desk. But actually, I think... As a landlord, we have a responsibility to provide the canvas for them and yeah, provide yeah, those activities. Yeah, so, you know, here, for example, at the Lennon Hall building, we're, we're just about to launch a series of events. With, you know, we're thinking about boot camps and Pilates classes oh, and nice. uh, sushi making classes, um, yeah. collaborating with our retailers downstairs to, um, um, to look at ways in which we can work together. Um, yeah, even something as simple as Aon, for example, on the on the lower floors of this yeah. building, who um, who work in the Lennon Hall building every day, but actually have the, all their staff been up to the 42nd floor? Have they seen the views from the top? They probably haven't. No. So they don't even know their experiences. They don't really have a full experience of working in this building. They know, just know the day-to-day -day reality of yeah. sitting at their desks, you know, yeah. um, every day. So I think it's, I think as landlords, we've got a responsibility to start innovating more, and that you know, is, is the main reason why CC Land in Hong Kong wanted to establish a UK office so we could start doing these things directly, um, you know, rather than a remote landlord collecting four checks a year, yeah. being actually in the thick of it, becoming yeah. not only part of the London establishment, but also 
innovating and thinking about different ways and to deliver services to our occupiers and to, um, to, to innovate. I think it's great. So building communities, which is not too dissimilar from what the co-working spaces are trying to do. Yeah, which yeah. Which seems to have really taken off the last, what, five, six years? Yeah, I mean, they call it sort of the great space race because there's so many occupy, uh, there's so many, um, a lot of the, the space coming out of the ground, in fact, just around the corner from here, number one poultry um, is rumored to be under offer in its entirety to WeWork. Oh, wow. So, um, you know. We've run into problems recently, I think. Um, or not? No, I don't think was so. Some announcement about their well, they, I think yeah. they're doing a bond issue. Are they? Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, so, um, look, who knows uh, yeah, yeah. about the, yeah. the future? That certainly they've made, I wouldn't go as far as an earthquake, but they've made a significant rumble in the market. Absolutely. Um, what's, been the, what's been the driver, do you think? Well, I think, you know, you obviously interviewed Matt um, from um, Federation of Small Businesses. Business. And, um, and, you know, there's... I think he gave some amazing statistics about how many people work for small businesses. You know, yeah. it's such a large sector of the market. And people don't, if you work for a small business, you're changing all the time, you're growing, you're, ex, you know, you're contracting. And um, you don't want to be stuck in a traditional lease for 10, 5, 3 years um, because you don't know where you're going to be the next year. And, and sometimes you don't know where, you know, the next fee is going to come from. Um, so actually the flexibility yeah. that, and the community yeah, yeah. that these yeah. um, co-working spaces offer is, you know, is first class. And I, I think the other issue is even if you look at the big corporates, so not just looking at the small businesses, the big corporates who have project-based uh, work where, say, for two years they win a contract where they need to hire 50 people, they don't want to turn around and take another floor in their office for 10 yeah. years. They want to be able to say, okay, you know what, we've got a co-working space or we've got a serviced office space in our building. We'll take a shorter term lease with you guys for the period of our contract. And then we know we can walk away. If it gets renewed, we yeah. roll it on or we consider taking longer, longer term space. So I think it's from both sides. It's yeah. the big corporates demanding um, additional overflow space and the smaller companies who de demand more flexibility. And are you, are you focusing on the big corporates? Or is there some aspect of well, I mean, I think SMEs from, and... Well, no, from our perspective, we obviously own large buildings. Yeah. And so invariably, um, there are large corporate occupiers within That's these buildings. Good. I think they, um, you know, we've got serve corporate, serviced okay, office in yeah. this building. I think, whereas before, serviced offices were almost a backfiller. So you'd, ah, lease, you'd lease six floors and the seventh floor you can't let. So what do you do? You call up a right. serviced office company and you let the seventh floor to them on you know, a softer deal than you ordinarily would do. Yeah. Whereas now they're almost the first one in because really? landlords are saying, I want to have that offer yeah. because that's going to be a drag for the corporates to come to my building. Absolutely. So it's, it's completely flipped over. Yeah. Um, and do you see that getting more and more prominent over time? Well, I think... I, I think like more co-working space. Yeah. Even we've got like you know the gig economy is growing. Uh, people like to work from SMEs. I think Matt's stats were. I mean, it's about fifty percent or more people in the UK work for an SME. Mm. Uh, well, I, I I think the answer to that is is we're cautiously optimistic because <laughs> uh, there's a flaky answer for you. But I, I think I think the danger is that everyone gets. Um, gets taken away by the whole co-working um, uh, buzz and there's too many companies yeah. built up and there's um, and, and there's that there, there invariably will need to be some consolidation in the market. Um, so I think it remains to be seen. What I do see is more of a um, collaboration style um, uh, sort of incubator concept happening. So where and we can already see it, where these larger tech or even going into property or architecture businesses, where they're actually taking additional space, potentially with the landlord, to become right. incubators for related companies to their industry. Oh, very interesting. Um, and they support and seed and back um, other, other um, ventures. Yeah. Um, that are related to their business, and you know we're starting to have a few uh, conversations with a few companies about about that concept. And I think that's where it might be interesting from a landlord's perspective. Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, there's a lot of startup incubators around. Yeah, and I know um, it, given we're in EC3, a lot of the big insurers fund and provide space and stuff for insure techs and fintechs and stuff. Well, look at Lloyd's so, of London. You know, that's sort yeah. of one of the 
that, that's an, that's one of the first hubs, right? If you yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Of, yeah, the Lloyd's Market. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and, and so with the so you've got the co-working stuff. You've also got co-living. Yeah. So you touched on it earlier. Um, obviously, residential property has gone up. A lot of people can't afford to live in London. Yeah. But yet, still, the jobs are here. Are you seeing like how people live or are living change? Well, I mean, we we've got um, sort of my experience um, goes back to just before the Olympics of 2010 in in the residential sector. Um, where we looked at, it wasn't even called PRS then, private rented sector, as it's sort of coined now, but it was just effectively a rental village. Right. Um, is this the Olympic? This uh, is the Olympic village. Of, yeah. yeah. So, um, so there we, we took a decision to, to let the 1,500 flats um, at the Olympic Park rather than sell them. Um, and that was part of delivering the Olympic um, legacy. Right. Um, so having been one landlord in control of the whole area, controlling the environment, preserving that legacy, which of course has um, sort of spectacularly failed in previous games, Athens and, and the yeah. like. So, um, so I think the 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 main um, the main driver there was was commercial legacy. But actually, you know, since that time, you've seen a huge swathe of private rental sector um, investment. Um, and I think that's a function of people not being able to afford their homes. Maybe a mindset change yeah. amongst Londoners saying, well, actually, do I need to own a home? I mean, Germany, you look at the statistics there, home France ownership, yeah. France as well. So, um, and then that's kind of taken the next step, which is, well, um, for these sort of first few years post coming out of university, do I, what are my options? I could either take a shared room in an apartment and pay quite a lot of money, not really get very much out of it, or I could live in part of a community, sort of a step up from my student digs. Yeah. And so there's been this advent of co-living, which hasn't really taken off massively because it's a difficult planning. Just so like project. sharing a student flat with someone. No, no, no. So this is this is effectively like a student accommodation, but right, a, okay. a profession done professionally. Right, so effectively, right. I mean, the, the best example is probably the collective. Uh, who've got a big scheme out in Old Oak Common, where right. um, I think they've got something like 500 rooms, and then on every floor, which are tiny, so under 200 square feet each, right. but then they supplement that with really amazing um, uh, community space, so shared kitchens, and, oh, okay. uh, and each floor's got a different theme, so one's like a, a disco laundry, the next one's a library, the next oh, one's awesome. a, uh, a cinema room. And so I think, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about before in terms yeah. of community um, and sort of craving that. And it won't be for everyone. You know, not everyone will want to live in a co-living space. No. Some people will, you know, uh, will want to share, share a digs or take a studio or whatever. Yeah. But, but actually, you know, looking at London and the finite amount of space that we have and the cost of living space, I think there'll be a lot of different op living options that come forward. And I think actually, you know, one other thing is that as infrastructure improves, so Crossrail 1 being the, yeah. you know, the main piece of infrastructure that's coming in at the moment, that I think people will spill out into the suburbs more. And I think if you look at the new London plan, yeah. actually there's a big push towards density. Um, so i.e. building bigger and more in Hot, the same spaces yeah. and higher, building, yeah. building higher, more massing yeah. um, in these uh, suburban locations close to yeah. transport and so I think you know you'll see that infrastructure really playing a playing a big part in in how London gets to work yeah. right I think that's also good for everyone's mindset because the thing with the big cities you can go for days without speaking to anyone yeah you can live in a flat you yeah. don't see anyone you come to work you haven't got your desk or you've come <laughs> up a little bit late and you've got to go down to well, here we've got black sheet coffee downstairs. So you might not actually have any human contact. Yeah. But with the stuff you're doing, with that development, it's interesting. It's just trying to get people to communicate and interact, which I think is great. Yeah, I mean, I think let's not make any mistake about this. I think, you know, why do, people, why do developers do it? They do it because they think they can make commercial sense no, out absolutely. of it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But actually, it's interesting to see how London's changing. And you yeah. know, no longer do you come out of university and necessarily think the first thing I need to do is save to go and get my, enough money to go and buy my first flat and get on the housing ladder. You think, I've come out of university, I want experiences, I want to um, 
I want to learn as much as possible from my employer and I want to do lots of different things whilst I'm young. So, But do you not think, though, that young people still do want to buy a flat? They just can't buy the flat. Because prices have gone up. So I think, what is it, like half a million quid for a one bed or something in London, right? I mean, most, most people, and then the average salary is like 28, 29 grand in London yeah. or something. Yeah. I mean, it's just unaffordable for most of these young people. Yeah, I, I think... It's a, I think effectively what you're asking is, is this out of need yeah. uh, or is it out of uh, effectively a, a, a change in mindset? And I think the yeah. answer is probably a bit of, bit of both, right? I think yeah. people can no longer uh, afford these spaces. So, you know, they look at alternatives yeah, and, that's um, true. and defer the problem. And that's potentially why suburban London yeah, yeah. will become more popular. And, you know, that could expand out even further because people don't necessarily accrue the capital in their first homes. And so they don't necessarily, they're not able to then buy, uh, use the capital from that to then buy their house in London. They have to look at their first home being further and further out. Yeah, um, true. So have the exper- all the experiences you want. And then when you want to settle back. down, you go out into the suburbs and, yeah. you know, or you know, even beyond London to, to then commute in. And so. so you're seeing a trend now of like developers building to lease? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, th- th- so that is the PRS sector, yeah. yeah. So there is a, a huge market and it's becoming sort of an institutionally acceptable market as well. Because of course, um, you know, part of the reason why we haven't seen it for 30 odd years in any great swathe is because the perception was that rese- residential uh, properties weren't an institutional product. Right. Okay. Um, and so, um, a, a, but now with high class management, um, a lot of the institutional investors are coming back in and saying, well, if we can run this right, and we do believe in the platform that's managing it, it's a sector that we want to give, we want to have some exposure to. So, so what overall, what's the current state of play with the London property market? Um, our market's a funny old place, um, and you know I think there's very few transactions going on in central London. Is this commercial and residential? Uh, I'm talking particularly about commercial, commercial property. Yeah. Um, so there's no. A couple of years ago, you know, I think, and, or even last year, there were a huge amount of transactions, um, and obviously slightly distorted by. Um, the cheese grater and the walkie-talkie both trading in, oh, okay. in 2017. Um, but I think for the very best, there are still buyers. I think where where assets are struggling is um, if there's a sort of secondary product out of there, which isn't quite cheap enough for the domestic market, so the UK traditional buyers, yeah. but isn't the sort of assets that the overseas buyers want to you know want 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 to uh, invest in. So. And I think that will level out over the next over the next year or so, and you'll see the domestic market coming back in. Um, you know, a lot a lot has to do with sentiment and confidence, and belief that um, you know we're not going to have a seismic shift in rents one way or the other. Yeah. Um, so you know, from our perspective, we think we think London's a, a great place to invest, and we're going to continue doing so. Um, and um, you know, we're we're very much. Um, um, you know, we're very keen to sort of continue to be a, a you know long term established here. Awesome, we've done half an hour. It's great. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me. No worries. And uh, keep building those communities. <laughs> <laughs> and invite me to uh, a TED talk or something. Will do. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lou. See ya. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.